how good is it when we have an environment or culture where we speak truth to each other and we challenge each other and we actually like that? Because we want to grow. We want to we wanna be better than what we were yesterday because we have a purpose and our purpose is Jesus. Um, the, we spoke about the spirit of dishonor and the spirit of honor a few Sundays back. Um, so we're going to transition into what that looks like in a culture of honor. When I say a culture of honor, I mean a normal behavior where we love each other more than tear each other down, where we empower each other more than disempower each other, where we put others first, just as Jesus did over our own gain or our own self or our own comfort. You see, we, we give ourselves the license to dishonor each other. And we say, hey, you sinned last week. That was a bad sin. So I don't, I don't want to honor what God's got in your life or your gift or who you are. I'm not going to listen to what you have to say to me. We do that because it's a normal culture in our, in our society where we find a reason why we don't actually have to step out of, out of our comfort zone, find a reason why we don't actually have to step out of ourself for someone else, which is challenging because the whole reason why we're here is to lay our life down and serve Jesus. How do we do that? It's a challenge. It's a challenge for me. I'm sure it's a challenge for everyone here. But what I do know is when there's a will, there's a way, and we have a power for God to help us get there. Um, interestingly enough, when we look in someone else's life to find a reason why we don't have to step up and lay our life down for them, uh, normally it's an exposed sin. It's something that we know about. Someone's made a mistake. It's a public mistake. All of a sudden, you've made a mistake, so I'm better than you now. Well, the thing is with that, we all have sin in our life. And uh, I think Paul said a few weeks back, if or I don't know if it was Paul or Alex, if we... Um, show the last 24 hours on a video screen behind us, how would we all feel, right? We would all be exposed. We, you know, and God doesn't do that. And we don't do that to each other. We say to each other, well, what you've done has consequences. There's, a, there's an impact. Well, yeah, that is true. But it's not a consequence or an impact that we put on each other. It's a consequence and an impact that sin puts on us and shame puts on us which actually, culture of honor and what Jesus would have us do to love is to lay ourselves down, lay our life down, so that person in that state, through grace, can actually move past it, can be actually back with us, actually operating in the kingdom of God, saving souls, empowering, equipping each other, encouraging each other. The other reason why we don't honor each other is because it's not easy. For example, you know, um, I like Alex. Alex is great. When we talk, we're very similar in our, in our mindset, you know, just good Aussie, raw conversation. It's easy to honor Alex. Alex is nice. He's, from as far as I'm aware, he's never said or done anything to hurt me. Not that I've felt anyway, which is good. So it's easy. Well, you know, it's easy to honor people that are the same as you. When you go into a room of people and you start to meet each other, you're going to be naturally attracted to those that are easy friends. Those where you don't have to really give anything. You can just be yourself. People that agree with you, you know. And um, how many of you know the reason why that is, is I see me and you, I love and honor myself, so I'm going to honor you because you're easy to honor, because I'm easy to honor. It's actually a very selfish mindset, to be honest, and, and I say that not in judgment to us here today. I say that in conviction to myself because God's been taking me through what selflessness looks like. And um, I always said to Ellie, I'm a pretty selfless guy, pretty humble guy, and she just giggles at me. She's like, well, if you're saying that, I think you've probably got work in that space, you know. Um, I'm sure all of you feel that way, you know. Uh, the thing is, wh when, we're, when we're going through and doing some business, we just have to 
speak truth in a way that empowers us to change, that empowers us to actually do this thing that God intended us to do. If we can master loving each other in a way that it's okay to get it wrong, in an environment where it's okay to make mistakes, well, we will create a culture and an environment in here that's attractable, that people actually want to be a part of. When they come into our church family, they stay. Honor is an environment where people are empowered, where they're valued, where they're loved, where grace is applied, where there is healthy boundaries and confrontation. That's the hard bit. Because if we have a problem, we need to talk about it in a way that honors you, honors me, and works towards that relationship being better than what it was. I'm just going to read in James 2, 1 to 4. If you have your Bibles, please turn. If you don't, we've got it up on the screen, potentially. Uh, just keeping, keeping in mind, I'm reading from the New King James Version because I just want to be old school, and this Bible is pretty awesome. Um, a beautiful person gave it to me. Um, if you're watching, thank you. I love it. Uh, James 2, verse 1 to 4. See, I have a problem when I preach. I've got really big hands, and I'm, you know, an average built guy. (laughs) Fairly big. So most of the preaching Bibles look tiny in my hands, and that's a problem, right? Because, you know, I've got big hands, and I'm like, got this little kind of thing up in front of me. Is that better? Um, I just want to ask one thing. In the camera, do I look like I'm in 60 minutes and there's like a you know, shadow? Because if I do, that's good. I can actually say some more truths, no? Okay. All right, for, for those that are listening as well, welcome. Thank you for watching. Um, bless you. And um, what I'm about to say is, is to empower us to see the kingdom of God on the earth like it's meant to. And uh, we've got a lot of barriers in the way at the moment, mostly our society um, and learn, learn culture, basically. Uh, we all have different cultures, traditions. We come into a church family um, and we do our best, uh, which is why we need leadership, we need guidance, we need revelation, uh, we need healing, we need deliverance, we need, we need all of the kingdom. One part of the kingdom will change our direction in the wrong course. We all come together. Culture and the way we live together, what is normal is really important. So it's not intended to bring shame. In fact, the opposite, to release us and empower us to change and, uh, and be Jesus on the earth. So chapter 2, 1 to 4. just might have some drink. Okay, so my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into, if someone should come into your assembly, a man with gold rings, fine apparel, and there should also be a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one that is wearing fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in the good place, and you sit here, poor man, over there. You or you stand here or sit at my footstool. So in the lowest place. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, he which promised to those who he loves? But you you have dishonored the poor man. Do not riches oppress you and drag you into, into the courts? As I was reading, I got carried away. I was liking what I was reading. I went to verse 5, sorry. It's easy to honour the rich man. And, and I had a bit of a story in my last message about, you know, not allowing someone into church because they just weren't cut the way we like. 
they weren't safe enough. The thing is, we would have an assumption that the poor person would be hard work. They would have problems. They might have healing that needs to take place. And then we would assume potentially that the rich person, he's got it all together. That's going to be an easy relationship. Well, I think God is, uh, you know, bringing some clarity in this space that actually, well, first of all, it's not what we have, what we look like. It's what's in our heart. How many of you know that? We might have no money but be rich in spirit and be more valuable to God and his kingdom than someone with one billion, one million dollars. Because if the heart position is not right, well, that's not going to be for God anyway. The thing is, honour is, and you know, if I'm going to bring this down to one statement, honour is me honouring you as if you are Jesus. I'll say that again. Honour is me honouring you as if you were Jesus. You might say, but I'm not Jesus. Well, I'm not. But what about the covering of Jesus? What about the blood? What about his body? What about the cross? You are in Jesus. Jesus is in you. What does that mean when I don't honour you? Well, I'm going to let you think about that. Today I'm going to try my best to focus on how do we proactively, in a positive way, establish a culture that sustains love and sustains the kingdom, becomes a flow or a portal for what God wants to do in the church. Building culture is intentionally, or maybe not. So we either build culture by default or design. When I say default, well, that is we come together as messy people and there you go. That's our culture. We do nothing about it. We don't actively try to see our culture turn into a kingdom culture. By design is where we go, well, what, it, what is our culture that we want to build? How do we build it? Who do we build it with? What do we need to do? What do we need to stop doing? How do, how do we as a people set such a standard that when someone walks into that door, they automatically fall into that culture and start living it? How do we set a standard that develops such a culture of love that when we go out into the world, they feel it, they breathe it, it transforms them, and they come in? How, how do we see revival? We were praying, Lord, send revival, and how many of you know that he wants to? He really wants to. But how many of you know that he's already provided us the tools and everything we need to see that one person at a time? I believe God's saying, well, well let's find the one and uh, we'll see what you do with the one. And then I'll give you the two and we'll see what you do with the two. And then the floodgates will open because God can now trust us with his people. We're not going to hurt them like every other church maybe has before they've come here or vice versa. I'm sure there's people being hurt here as well. It's just the nature of people. We're all people. We're all on a journey. We all have stuff. So by design, and that's what we're going to focus on today for part of this message, I would love to encourage everybody that by design, the way you live, the way you speak, the way you interact with each other, or that you don't interact with each other, is by design. That we would be intentional to see the way we live represent what the kingdom or what Jesus intends for us personally to live. We would not live by default, meaning... Well, for an example, we don't get along. Helen, I know we do, so I can use you as an example. For example, if we didn't get along. That, that instead of judging you for your differences, I would then say, well, Helen, I need you so much because you're so different to me. I need friends like you. And in fact, I want to do everything I can to see 
who God's called you to be come into being. And I'm going to do that by getting out of your way first. I'm going to give you space to, you know, get to where God wants you to be. But if we have a disagreement, I'm not going to sit back and judge you. Maybe, maybe there's hurt there. Maybe it was me and I was projecting it on you. But I'm going to choose to see God in you over what's not working in our relationship. There is power in the way we interact with each other. If we say, Nick, bro, he ticked me off last week. He didn't, by the way. Although, I'm sure everyone's struggling with envy with that beard and that hair. It's pretty good. I mean, like, uh, how could I say that? Like, I ticked off probably Ellie this week, you know, <laughs> a few times. I got it wrong. You know, I'm preparing this message, and yeah, there's, <laughs> there's yeah, it's recorded. Um, I just like to strike that bit from the <laughs> message. The thing is, I mean, does it really matter? The way he looked at me, does it really matter? I looked at someone, you know, with judgment eyes this week probably as well, and I had to go, oh, God, search my heart. Might have been in a moment, it might have taken a few days, or it might have taken a week, but, you know. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better if I went up to Nick and said, bro, you're amazing. But I didn't just leave it there and, you know, fluff over everything and pretend everything's okay and said, hey, you looked at me last week and, you know, I was just really concerned that I upset you. I love you so much and I just want to have a conversation about that. Is there anything that I've done to um, cause you to feel, you know, or is there anything that I can do to, um, you know, mend this relationship or whatever it is? There might be nothing there. It might have just been the enemy accusing of the brethren saying, hey, that person over there. If we can have that level of relationship with each other, and not only that, if you all put your hand up today and told us all your sins currently in your life and that you've previously done, I, I'm not sure if we have a culture matured yet enough, although we do have a beautiful culture of honour here already, I'm not sure if we have a culture matured enough where we would know how to handle that just yet. I feel like we still have some time um, to develop in this area, and that's okay because, you know, I started to work in this space in my life like 15 years ago, and I'm still getting it wrong, I'm still learning, I'm still growing. The thing is, if we don't have a safe culture where we can bring realities and truths to each other in a safe way with safe boundaries, well, straight away, the dark is kept in the dark. Straight away, we're isolated from the church and each other. Because if we tell each other what we got wrong, well, probably going to get judged and disempowered and demoted and all the rest of it. Um, Paul spoke the other week and he was talking about, you know, he's the chief of sinners. Well, the thing is, leaders are not perfect. Um, all we can do is be humble and just pray that Jesus would come again in our life the same for all of us if we would have a culture where we could talk about the things that are not talked about imagine the freedom that will come out of that so i think we need to work on that um not specifically in presence but as a people as a community all over australia all over the world so if you're listening to this and that's speaking to your heart i'd like to challenge you today as god challenged me well are we going to live by default or design and if we're going to live by design well what better place to start than the word what does god say about it i just want to share quickly just a story there are unhealthy honor sorry there is unhealthy honor where you know i'll pick on alex again where i'm like alex bro you're amazing you preached the message last week or the week before beautiful it rocked my world it was awesome and then i go to ellie and like mate that alex guy and I just, oh. I can do better than him. I don't think I can, but. 
Sorry, Alex, I don't actually mean that. I love you, and your message was beautiful. It was. But that is not healthy honor. We are praising and esteeming, but we're doing it with our lips, we're not doing it with our heart. Honor would look completely different. Honor actually would be like, and there's actually nothing to discuss from a confrontation perspective, but I'm just using this as an example, Alex. Honor, honor would be like, hey, I loved your message. Um, it spoke to my heart, it transformed my life. I actually want to bless you. How can I bless you to keep doing what you're doing? How can I support you? How can I pray for you? What do you need? Because what you brought is beautiful, and the, the kingdom of God needs it. And then if I had a problem with his message, I could, and please don't do this to Paul or Alex. You can do it to me, that's fine, because I'm saying it. But if I had an issue, hey, Alex, when you said, you know, that I have to be real with myself, what did you mean by, by that? I didn't like it. But I, I'm going to actually submit to honouring you. What did you mean by that? Well, straight away, it would unlock a conversation and probably you know, expose that it was my heart and not his heart. He wasn't saying anything intentional to me from the pulpit directly because he had no idea about my life, what I was thinking about in that moment. That's what honour looks like. It's not... It's not actually what did you do wrong, it's how can I bless and support you to keep getting it right. So I've been in leadership models before and, um, you know, my leaders got it wrong, I got it wrong, how I led people, I got it wrong. I got it right as well, which is a good thing. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> Nina and Rob, they're from back in the day. Love you both. Anyone else as well, maybe? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can have unhealthy honour where I would do something for Karen just because she asked me to do it but deep down inside I don't want to do it and I'm going to complain about it but Karen and Alex have an office in the church and the Bible is clear that we honour them we honour each other but there's, there's different levels and different reasons why we honour. We're going to go into that in a moment, in a little bit. But I, I, I was in this leadership position, and I started off pretty free. I was wanting to see the kingdom come. I was, like, getting right into it, you know? Worship nights, 24-7, people at my house, parties. That's where I met Ellie. So if it was just all for that, I'm grateful. I was like raring to go. And then it became my identity and it became what I did. It became the expectation. So what do you do when there's an expectation that you might not be able to meet because of where your heart position's at? Well, you perform. You give false honour. I was going to my leaders, what do you want from me? And then just doing it. I wasn't going to Jesus, fill me up, so I can be Jesus to them and so I can honour my leaders because I'm honouring you when I'm doing that. I was honouring so I got it right and I looked good and I burnt out. Um, the fact that I'm standing up here today is a miracle. <sighs> Maybe, I don't know. Any, anyone that knows body language, I just touch my glasses, so, you know, that kind of means I don't actually really believe that, but, you know, I said it. So... I went away from Jesus before I stepped into leadership uh, when I was uh, just 26, I think it was. So at 20, 22, I, my heart was pretty hard and I, I went off and I partied and, you know, if you have a list of everything you shouldn't be doing, I went out and said to my parents, ha, I did it all. I told Jesus I don't love him. I wasn't in a good place. I didn't actually really know Jesus, to be honest. I, I knew the church, I knew religion, I knew some of the word, didn't have a revelation with the Father, didn't have a revelation with Jesus, had a couple of encounters of the Holy Spirit, most of it was what I saw, not what I experienced. Anyway, I, uh, I was pretty broken, a few things happened, and I said, Jesus, well, you know what, I don't want to live anymore, that's how I feel, I need you to take this from me. 
If you would take the pain, I will serve you forever. If you would take the pain, I will be a leader in your church. If you would take the pain, everything I do will be to give you glory. Well, he took the pain, but then I picked up my life again. <laughs> and I went through this process, I laid it down, I picked it up, I laid it down, I picked it up, laid it down, picked it up. Laid it down on Monday, picked it up on Tuesday, laid it down this morning, thankfully, before I preached. <laughs> Go through this process of, well, laying it down, picking it up. Because it's, it's, it's by default, right? It's not by design. What are we intentionally doing to keep our life laid down for Jesus? And when we feel like we're going to pick it up, or if we do, we lay it straight back down again. When I think of honor, I think of a knight's honor. And um, the thing is about a knight, there's a kingdom, there's a king, there's a queen, there's a general, there's your brothers in arms, um, and also commonly family at home. So when a knight goes into battle, he's going into battle for his brothers he's fighting with, because if he doesn't, well, they're probably going to get taken out. Really key in honor here, right, guys and girls and everyone else? We fight for each other. A knight fights for his king, for their leaders. They fight for their kingdom. Well, what is our kingdom? It's the kingdom of God. And they fight for their family and their friends. When a knight honors his king, his kingdom, his purpose, he brings honor on his family that lasts forever through their genealogy. Honor is a spiritual currency that not only is when we honor each other, it goes and flows through all of us into the future. Our children, when we're talking about culture, well, culture is what the next generation has as the normal. So whatever we set up right now, as our design or what we design as our culture is going to be the normal for those to come, for those that are going to stand on our shoulders. It's really important. If you could turn to me, turn with me to Romans 12 in verse 1. <laughs> How are we going, everyone? Can I, um, can I ask for some brave people? Can you put your hand up with me if you've allowed your culture to be by default? I'm going to put my hand up. I'm in that. I, and then show of hands if you're intentionally designing what the culture of God, the kingdom of heaven, should be looking like in your life and around you. Beautiful. We need you. Help us. Help us get there. If, if you already have that perspective where you're looking at how to develop this culture of honour in your life and those around you and you're loving and honouring people, then you're God's biggest assets right now to spread that through the church and also the community. Because when they see that, they see Jesus. So thank you. In verse... Well, I might just start in verse 3, actually just to save on time, for I say, through grace is given to me to everyone, who has, to everyone who is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to. Alex touched on this scripture uh, in his last message. But think soberly, as God has, de has dealt with each one, sorry, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us then use them if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, let us minister. He who teaches, in teaching. 
He who exalts in exaltation. He who gives with liberty. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Refuse what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honour, give preference to one another. Some translations would be, would say, outdo each other. Outdo each other in honour. Honour each other so much that the next person is honouring more than you. And then you have to honour more. Keep going, keep building it, keep growing it. It's a really important key here. Not lagging in diligence, fervent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, Distributing the needs to the saints given in hospitality. Hmm. Caring for each other, looking after each other, providing solutions to the needs of our brothers and sisters. Bless those who persecute, persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So important, it was said twice in the same sentence. Bless those who persecute, persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Come on. I think that's important. Bless each other. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be in the same mind towards one another. Be in unity. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for the things that are good in the sight of all men, and if possible. I like this verse. As much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. As much as it depends on you, do what you can. Where's your influence? How can you make an impact? You can't control other people. You can control yourself. That's another key. Well, if we're looking for a roadmap, how do we start being intentional about having a culture of honour? Well, Verse 3, humility. Don't think of ourselves more prideful than what we are. Love the poor man as equal as you love the rich man. Genuine love, outdo each other in honour. Verse 9. Verse 12, be hopeful and patient and consistent in prayer together. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of believers and show them hospitality. Serve each other. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Well, we went through that. Verse 15, cry with each other. Be compassionate with each other. Don't say, I want to be with you in the good times, but I'm not going to be there when something's gone wrong. I'm going to shut my door and be like, I don't have time for you today. Honor is, does not look like when it's easy. I'll say that again. Honor doesn't... Honor's not genuine when it's just easy, although it can be genuine when it is easy. It's genuine on both sides of the fence. Verse 16, live in harmony. Don't be haughty or associate with lowly, with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Verse 17, do not repay evil for evil, evil but think about honourable things towards each other. 18, be peaceful. 19, we didn't read 19, but let's have a look at verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, the Lord says. Therefore, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give them drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So it gives us a bit of a roadmap here. We bring good to the bad. The bad turns into good. Happy days. We bring the kingdom culture to an earthly culture. Happy days. The trick is doing that consistently. This passage goes through thinking honour, speaking honour, practising honour and establishing a culture where honour is normal. These are the things that have been written here by Paul that we should be thinking about in the church, doing together.
This is not a leader's job. This is our job together. Come on, church. We need to develop a discipline of honor. Can everyone say with me? We need to develop a discipline of honor. Develop a discipline of honor. Discipline of honor. Discipline of honor. Well, you are an obedient bunch. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've been out to dinner with some of you here or, or meals and I would like to keep that up and get to know everyone. It's a bit more difficult with two children, but we want to do that. What I would say, though, is the culture of honor that we have here at Presence is beautiful, and this message is to help us refresh our mindset and, and be intentional together as, as a whole people. Um, there's been people here we'll go out to dinner with, and they're running up to the checkout to pay because they want to be the one to bless. That is honor. Don't have to do that. And I think most people here do that. You go out to lunch and all of a sudden someone wants to pay for you. That's beautiful. That's being selfless. And, you know, nine times out of ten, the person that's paying for someone else probably doesn't have much money themselves. They're just laying what they have down because God said to. What we actually need is a revelation of God's heart to each other. If we're going to have a discipline of honor, well... We need God's heart for that person. Because when they get it wrong, understanding God's heart for them means we're going to love them anyway. Isn't that what we want? We want to be loved when we get it wrong, and we sure get it wrong all the time. Kingdom of honor, honors up or north, south, east, west, up, down, all around. We honor leaders. Leaders honor congregation. Congregation honors each other. Everyone honors everyone. We might have different roles. We'll go into that quickly after this. But honor goes all around. It's not just for me, it's for you. In fact, being up here preaching today, technically I'm a servant, part of the foundation, which you walk on. Please don't step on me in a nasty way. So we're going to talk about leaders for a little bit because if we're going to establish a culture where we're honoring each other, well, we need to understand how to honor our leaders. Um, it's acknowledging who they are, what level of influence they have in our life. It's blessing them. Leaders are held to a higher level of expectation and scrutiny. We only have to open a couple of passages to see that. We don't need to judge them. They will get it wrong, but God's holding them accountable. It's not our job. Amen. Come on. God has placed all leaders in our life for a reason. He doesn't control us. I'm going to rephrase that. He doesn't control leaders. I'm not going to put myself in that camp. I'm just the preacher today. When we honor the office, we honor Jesus. We don't have to honor the person's behavior, we can honor the office that they're in in our life. Because when we honor that, we honor Jesus and we do our part to play. We stay in alignment. We have safety and spiritual covering. Leaders are accountable for their leadership and God empowers them to lead. God gives them something we don't have. So if God's given them something we don't have, well, what do we do? We just get out of the way. We don't have to think we can do it better than them. Maybe we can, but the fact that God has said they're the leader means we honor that office. We serve them. Let's quickly turn to Luke 14, verse 8. How are we going for time, everyone? I, I know that there's a lot in this message. Um, technically, I could have extended it to 10 weeks or more. Um, but I just, cool. I just wanted to get as much into this message as possible when it comes to what a culture of honor looks like and what it means to us. There'll be lots of time, I would assume, in the future where we can unlock, whether it's I'm at the front or someone else, 
what that actually looks like in daily life. Um, you get me next week as well. I'm going to start to talk about a little bit about what that looks like and, and how we work through uh, things together on a practical level. We won't go there today just because, you know, don't want to overload everyone. So chapter 14, verse 8. When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit in the best place, lest one more honourable than you be invited by him. This is the guest. So the host, sorry. He who invited you, he who invited you and him may come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that he who invited you may come in and say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For he who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, what is Jesus talking about here? I know that, you know, uh, the humility, yeah. But when I read this, and I'm thinking about leadership, I'm like, well, God sets the leaders in place according to what he sees fit in their calling and the gifting and the right time. Who are we to say that leaders aren't where they're meant to be? Who are we to judge them? Well, God's given them the place. He's given them the power. He's given them the gifting. He's given them the calling. He's given them the space. They might get it wrong. And they most likely will. But then he said, he's the judge and he's going to hold them accountable. So we can remove that from our hearts and our mindsets and our actions we don't need to worry about what leaders are doing god's worrying about what they're doing we just need to worry about what we're doing you see when we sit in the lowest place what is that that's serving that's that's a place of serving when we serve with humility what does god do he says that's a good leader i can mold him or her I can do something in their life because they've put themselves to the side because you're not going to lay your life down and be a servant if you haven't understood humility. And what does Jesus do? He lifts you up and he places you in a seat of honour, seat of leadership, a place of influence. You with me? I think that's awesome. All we need to do is serve. Why do we have to be a servant first? Because any position of leadership, you're just a servant. You have a level of power, but you have to serve. You're the foundation, not the roof. You're the foundation, not the roof. You say it loud enough so it goes into the camera. It's good. People are agreeing, that's good. <laughs> the role of a leader is tough and challenging sometimes, and uh, please bear with me. I would like to take a little bit more time given that Paul and Sasha aren't here. I think it's a really good time to talk about leadership and how to honour them. Because it's just weird if they're sitting here and we're going to talk about how we're going to honour them, right? I think God has kind of lined this up really good. We're all okay with that? Cool. Being a leader is tough, challenging, exhausting. A leader needs support so they can effectively lead consistently and long and with longevity. Leaders aren't perfect. Honouring leaders is giving them the opportunity that their office requires to safely guide us, to safely steward what God has called them to do in our life. From our perspective, we acknowledge who they are, the giftings that, that's on their life, and in, do, in doing so, they then leave a deposit in our life. But what does that honouring look like? And I'm just going to be real here. It's not just coming to church on a Sunday and going, thank you very much, and consuming. It's coming to church and going, what you said impacted my life and what you're doing is impacting my life and my family and my whole generations of my, my whole genealogy of my children. How can I stand with you? How can I bless you? How can I serve you? How can I help you in a practical way that you can do this not only in this house, but in the lunga, not only in the lunga, but across the face of Australia, not only across the face of Australia, but across the face of the earth. 
our leaders are limited to the amount that we're prepared to serve them and support them and lift them up. The thing is, and this includes all the leaders that are here as well in Presence Church, they lay their life down for us. They give everything for us. They can't do this themselves. The church is not their church. It's Jesus' church. They're here to see the kingdom come. They're here to see God's work and his will be done in our lives and the community. They need us. This I'm really passionate about because time and time again I've seen leaders burn out. They've given everything. And I've even been a consumer where I've just taken and not given. It's not kingdom culture. It's not a culture of honour. We need leaders, otherwise we've got the blind leading the blind. We just have to accept that there's certain people God has given gifts to empower us and to lead us, to keep us safe, to help us become free. There is apostolic leadership in ministry, I'll touch on a little bit. I'm not going to go into the full theology of that. I think that's probably a different sermon and something that um, maybe Paul would be going through at a leader's message i don't know but for us here today just touching a little bit in timothy first timothy five seventeen, it says you don't need to turn there uh, elders considered worthy of a double honor especially preachers and teachers and i touched on this last sermon well why that why is that well it's because the more we honor them the more we draw out of them the more they impact our life but what i didn't touch on is the more we honor them the more they impact the church, the more they impact the community, the more they impact the nations and the lost. The more we lift them up, the greater things God does in their life. We don't just be like, you're amazing, you're so good, we're not their cheerleaders, we don't want to please them. No, we actually want to get down and messy and muddy and say, how can we work with you to see God's calling come into full fruition in your life because right now you're giving everything you got to us there are practical things that leaders need um, and this is not an offering message but there's an offering there okay and this is not something to say you need to give them money at all this this is a place of heart towards those that are leading you where that you would go what practically do you need how, what resources do I have to help you? It might be being on the camera, being on the worship team, helping out with the Christmas function. Well, you might think, do I have time for that? But the thing is, if we, if we have a culture where we're honouring each other and we're going, well, Bo's, he's, spend, he's working full time, he's spending all of his time to get this thing going, he's had people, uh, you know, promise and then uh, change those promises there's been a lot that's going on he needs us church Bo needs us for the christmas event I'm not telling you to help out what i'm saying though is if we want to honor Bo and what he's called to to reach out to the lost which we're not currently really doing uh, corporately then there are things that he needs to actually be able to do that effectively we have what he needs we just need to have that conversation. How many of you know that it is crucial we position our hearts to be led? If we can't be led, we then position our hearts to be independent. When we're independent, we're isolated, we're by ourselves. We've now exposed ourselves to the enemy to then isolate us more and then we end up doing the wrong thing and then shame comes in and brings us down and then our perspective of ourselves goes low and we think we're poor and we think we have nothing to offer the church and nothing to offer God. But when we, are, when we have our heart to be led, we're willing to be vulnerable. We're willing to, willing to say, I don't have it right, help me. What do I need to do right now? Straight away we expose it, we bring it to the light, we're all on the same page, happy days, we're not isolated anymore. We're the church that he created the church to be. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. Well, obeying your leaders and submitting to them doesn't mean going, Master, Help me understand how to love you. That's what we do to Jesus. When we submit to them, we acknowledge their calling and we stand with them. We say, what do you need? 
I'm here to help you. You're speaking to my life. How can I help you? It's a two-way street here. Hebrews 13, 17, leaders that speak truth, consider their fruits and imitate them. So our leaders, they're speaking truth. We can just look at any leader in this house. The fruits of God are all over their lives. Well, let's imitate them. Scripture is very important because we're not submitting to leaders that are doing the wrong thing and imitating them through submission. What we're doing is we're submitting to God and we're loving them. As we're loving them, we're seeing the fruits of God in their life. Then we're imitating what fruits are coming out of their life because that is good and that's an example and a blueprint and a roadmap for us to live our life. Big sentence. And I'm very sorry I'm talking fast. There's so much in here. Woo-hoo. Romans 13.1. All authority has been instituted by God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13. Respect those who labor over you in the Lord. Esteem them very highly in love. Because of their work, be at peace together. It's not easy what they do. Galatians 6, 6. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the teacher. We are not just consumers, as I said. I'm not telling you to share all your good stuff with me today. Proverbs 11:14 Where there is no guidance a people falls where there are counselors there is safety We can't get away from the fact that we need our leaders We can't get away from the fact that they need us We can't get away from the fact that we need each other Well how do we create an environment where the kingdom of God is flowing and moving through our leaders through us on the earth in our church out to the community I believe that's a culture of honor I think we're a few steps towards that, not far away. I don't think he likes the timing of the preaching. I'm going to wrap it up. We're almost there. When we celebrate each other and who God created us to be, we unlock power and truth in each other for transformation. We honor on the basis of who Jesus is in us and who he is in you, not what you do. God first honoured us. God created us in his own image. We honour the office. We honour all people and we honour the church and we honour the lost. We recognise and honour each other's abilities, giftings, callings that contribute to the kingdom and the local community. And greater. So I've got a bit of a call to action here. Call call to action today is a commitment to establish a counterculture. We do that together. An agreement to hold ourselves accountable that we will actively work together. Establishment, to set personal example within the church family, each of us, and be okay getting it wrong. And then to spread the love, to extend this culture into the community and make every effort and every interaction count. See, when we achieve a culture where honour is the default, we fertilise that garden. When we fertilise that garden and we throw the seeds, beautiful things bloom. And the key is here, when we stretch out our nets and God says... Here's the harvest. We catch it. People come and they stay. If everyone stayed in every church that ever walked through the door, whether it's transferred from church to church and not going back out into the world, the kingdom of God right now in the church would be so full and so powerful. When we establish a culture where we honour each other as a normality, it's okay if we get it wrong, and we stretch out our nets and the harvest comes in, we keep them. Because there's an environment where they can be honest, they can be healed, they can be set free, they can be empowered, they can be equipped, and they can be a part of the pro- solution, not the problem. Thank you so much, church, because uh, I know you've been sitting there for probably 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes. I wasn't intending on going past 30 minutes. So I'm so sorry, Bo and Alex and Karen. But the thing is, God is doing something. We are his soldiers. We don't have it right. We never will. But if we put on the armor of God and we put on who he is in our life, we have everything we need to get it right and make that intentional, intentional decision to be a part of that culture, being a normality where we honor each other. Thank you very much.